All right, and I'll turn it over to our presenters. So I will go first. I am actually filling in today for Dr. Shook, um, but my name is Molly Clark. I am a health psychologist at the University of Mississippi Medical Center in Jackson, Mississippi, and I'm also board certified. I am also part of my role in being here today. I'm the exam coordinator for the uh, ABIP exam in clinical health psychology. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michael Purdom. Uh, I am um, board certified in health psychology since 2015. I'm a clinical psychologist at the Lewis Stokes Cleveland VA, where I'm also the um, team leader for primary care mental health integration here in Cleveland and uh, serve as a a, a review, I, I do some reviewing of, of written exams and also serve as a mentor as part of the board. So glad that we have so many people participating today. I can navigate further, Molly, here, so. Please, please, yeah, feel free Hopefully to. here, we'll see. <laughs> I think it's important to really review the mission statement overall related to the American Board of Professional Psychology, which is to serve the public by promoting the profession, uh, the provision of quality psychological services through the examination and certification of professional psychologists engaged in specialty practice. So that is the overall mission of uh, the American Board of Professional Psychology. And I think it's important that we remember that. If we move forward, uh, the objectives for today, I'm not going to read those objectives off of the screen, but really what I, I'm hopeful that you get today out of this is, is why should I obtain board certification? So an answer uh, to that question in clinical health psychology, what are those benefits to me personally? What may, may those benefits be to the organization in which I work or the institution? And how does this impact the public or the patients or the clients that you may serve? I also hope that we will detail a process. And again, you know, please feel free to ask questions related to what the process is like for this um, particular certification. What is the time frame? Um, but I also hope that we get across that, that there is an emphasis whenever you become board certified in clinical health psychology, that you are identifying as a clinical health psychologist and that, that we are emphasizing that, that identity, but also that we also strive uh, to represent that we need a diverse representation and inclusion um, of, of people as a clinical health psychologists. We will also cover other information, detailed information related to cost of the exam, as well as some other resources uh, that you may find helpful. So it's important to note how this particular certification differs from others. And clinical health psychology is a specialty that is defined by how we apply scientific knowledge um, through the interrelationship among behavioral, emotional, cognitive, social, and biological components in healthcare and health and disease. This is through primary prevention. So really looking at how do we do health promotion and maintenance of health and not just treat disease, but we are also looking at how do we treat and rehabilitate illness and disability. You will also find that clinical health psychologists also look to improve the healthcare delivery system or the healthcare systems. We're able to look at that in a very dynamic way and bring our expertise in, in systems change to that area. We're also uh, dedicated to the development of knowledge uh, related to the interface between behavior and health and the delivery of high quality services within those domains. What are the important, what is important uh, about and, and what are the benefits of board certification? 
Well, for me, the, the first several bullet points there are all related. Really, board certification in clinical health psychology really speaks to competence, your competency within that domain, the quality of services that you're providing, and an expertise to provide care in clinical health psychology. And this is a complex specialty. So when you define yourself as a board certified clinical health psychologist, um, and Ron Rosinski spoke to this sort of in general, but said you're committing yourself to a focused competency-based practice, which assures that you're more accountable to what you're doing clinically. Because you've gone through this process, it speaks to you have had peers, um, those who are experts in clinical health psychology, look at what you're doing and speak to your competency the quality of your work and your practice. In terms of some of the benefits that you may receive related to this, there are healthcare and academic context benefits. So your institution may require board certification. Um, that is required sometimes in sort of academic health science centers as well as other hospital settings. Um, so there may be some incentive for you to en engage in the board certification uh. process. You may notice the benefits to be able to say if you have board certification in the hiring process, you can use that as a, um, as, as a teaching point and as a, as a sort of benefit that you have. Um, you can also use this in promotion and tenure materials if you're in an academic setting or an academic health science center. There's also something to be said that if you're working in the field of clinical health psychology, that to say that you are board certified, you align, align yourself with the physician culture um, and that understands what board certification means. So we, we are speaking the same language and it speaks to, again, that competency and quality and expertise that you, you possess. It verifies your education, training, and experience. Um, I think one particular quote um, from Gregory Lee, an ABIP past president, says it, it helps you to consolidate your skills and become very thoughtful about what you do, how you do it, and to be able to communicate that very easily. To me, it's all about intentionality. It's not just saying that you have these skill sets and you were just taught how to do this, but it is really saying that you can explain the why behind what you're doing. And it communicates your commitment to the and competency to the public as well. So in terms of that public benefit, it really does speak that you have set yourself apart um, and that you are providing and a level of expertise. And I think that that's really important when we talk about, I won't call out particular disciplines, but if there's discipline creep, sometimes we see different, different specialists saying that they do, can do what clinical health psychologists do. Um, but this, this really sets yourself apart from those others. Okay, so in terms of the process, I want to highlight the fact that mentoring is available throughout each of these steps. And so there is a general candidacy application, and we'll talk more about what that entails here in a, in a moment. But there is also a practice sample for clinical health psychology that must be submitted. And then there's the oral exam. And so once you go through that general... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Once you go through that general candidacy application mm -hmm. process and that general application is approved, you are able to submit your practice sample. And then once those practice samples are reviewed and approved, then you sit for your oral exam. So we'll talk a little bit about the generic application uh, and the requirements for that. So 
with regard to, to that general application, it does require um, a doctoral degree um, that a doctoral program um, has met the requirements of the a ABIP generic doctoral program eligibility requirements, which are um, the following. Uh, that your, your degree was granted from an institution that was accredited by the APA, CPA, or that it was listed in the publication for the doctoral psychology programs meeting designation criteria. This could also mean that if you have a CPQ, which is a certificate of professional qualification um, that from ASPPB, that would also meet those requirements. It is important that anybody who obtained their doctoral degrees in 2018 or later uh, from an institution in the United States or Canada, they must have been awarded their doctoral degree from a doctoral program that was accredited by the American Psychological Association, the Canadian Psychological Association, or an accrediting agency recognized by the US Department of Education at the time of their graduation. Um, so that is what that application is looking for to make sure that those degree requirements have been met. Um, all ABIP candidates in the United States, its territories or Canada must be licensed as a psychologist for independent practice at the doctoral level in a jurisdiction of the US or um, in, in Canada. So in addition to those requirements, the by its nature, the specialty of clinical health psychology denotes a level of practice that requires preparation beyond the doctoral uh, requirements. So an individual who, whose degree is from an APA or CPA accredited program in professional psychology must also have completed um, one of these uh, following <laughs> training experiences. So you, you would either have to have one, one year or more a postdoctoral um, APA or AP or CPA accredited clinical health psychology fellowship. You can also meet that criteria by the completion of two postdoctoral years of an APA or CPA accredited fellowship in an area other than clinical health psychology, but it must include greater than 50% um, training or greater than or equal to 50% training plus an additional year of clinical health psychology experience, or um, you can meet that criteria through a non-accredited APIC listed clinical health psychology fellowship plus one year of clinical health uh, psychology experience, or three years of uh, after three years of postdoctoral work, including one year um, of supervised. Uh, a supervised year and two years of experience in clinical health psychology. So those are the generic application requirements for this particular um, cert certification. Now, I, I'm gonna go back just one second, sorry. Um, one of the most common reasons why people don't pass the credentials review point, so this is, again, that generic application, is they may apply too early from a non-clinical health psychology um, APA accredited postdoctoral um, program, um, or they may um, be, how do I want to say this, um, they may not be delivering clinical health psychology services during that first or two years after postdoc. And how I wanna differentiate that is, is, is you can be practicing psychology and a patient has health concerns, but are you truly practicing clinical health psychology? And that's why it was important to go through that definition that we went through at first. Are you really, operating as a clinical health psychologist. And so your materials will need to demonstrate that. So I just wanted to highlight that as some of the hangup points that you may have 
um, or that most folks may may kind of run into. In terms of the submission materials, there is the online application for clinical health psychology. You will need an official uh, doctoral transcript, an internship certificate, and there are two endorsement forms, meaning that you have two other people who will sign off um, as an endorsing you to seek certification. There, are, there is a $125 fee application for the application and credential review. However, if you're an early career psychologist, as defined by less than 10 years from your doctoral degree um, when it was granted, that fee is $65, or you can have a $25 uh, early entry. Um, it, that's a 100% discount there if that's done earlier. Um, the fee may be waived um, if um, you're already board certified in another specialty, and that fee is waived if you are a training director. So I notice um, that there were some questions, but we may address some of those, I guess, at the end. Okay, so after the initial process and the application has been accepted and, and you're kind of moving forward, the next, the next phase is the practice sample submission. So this includes your practice samples and we'll, we'll talk more about what those will look like, um, your professional statement, um, your CV, and um, you know, the CV and professional statements serve as part of the discussion for the oral exam, but also your practice samples will also serve as, as part of the discussion in the oral exam <clears throat> and be a main component to the oral examination. Um, and then a $200 fee for the practice sample review and the establishment of the oral examination team. So we'll talk more about the professional statement next and the components. So the professional statement really should be about 10 to 12 pages of a, a narrative of, of, your, of your professional contributions and, and your work in clinical health psychology. So, um, you know, a statement of your current professional work to include uh, evidence of science and, and uh, application base that you're applying uh, these elements uh, as part of your work and that you're demonstrating those areas of assessment, uh, intervention, consultation, program development. Um, also individual and cultural diversity would be part of that professional statement. Um, I think this might be one of the areas in which some people may, may not kind of describe or explain um, maybe the detail and the level of their work that they're doing from kind of a cultural diverse area uh, or socioeconomic area. Um, and uh, so I just kind of wanted to kind of highlight that, that that's a very important aspect of kind of describing um, how you're choosing certain um, interventions or consultations based on uh, the specific uh, specific people that you're uh, uh, or demographics that you're working with. Um, you know, also explaining uh, complex interpersonal interactions that you've had with maybe a team or an individual and how you've kind of solved those um, complex interactions that, um, you know, that, that do come about. Uh, most of us as health psychologists, we work in teams. And, and so there are, um, you know, interpersonal interactions that can be challenging at times um, that, we, that we need to demonstrate that we know how to work through those um, professionally uh, for the benefit of the patient, but also, um, you know, uh, the profession as a whole. Um, and then also you would verify that you have no ethical legal or legal complaints against you. And then you would also describe a challenging ethical uh, dilemma that maybe you have encountered um, as part of your uh, time as a clinical health psychologist. 
Um, the practice samples really are the heart of your work. Um, they describe your work, including, you know, your theoretical and empirical basis of your approach. So, you know, you're really, you really want to kind of describe in a systematic and scientific way why you're going about um, and, and treating or assessing or consulting or whatever it is that you might be doing to demonstrate the competency that it's really based in research. Um, and and you, you really want to kind of use more of a, a narrative approach in this. I, uh, sometimes a lot of people will submit uh, samples and it's, it's basically kind of just highlighting, uh, it's kind of like maybe 10 progress notes are, are submitted. Um, so that's not really what we're looking for. We're not looking for this. Yes, you would include that as part of your work, but you're really kind of providing a narrative of each session or uh, the assessment that you completed and you're really um, breaking it down and providing specific rationale for why you did this and, and why you did it here or there based on also cultural um, factors and relevant ethical issues that you may have run into. So I would say describing more of, of why you did and what you and the rationale behind it is a is a good thing. Um, sometimes brevity, except for maybe the PCMHI samples that we'll talk about, um, you know, you, you want to make sure that you're including enough about the work and why you're doing it. Um, there are two options for clinical health psychology. Uh, there's a standard candidate option as well as a standard candidate primary care option that you can submit under. Let me go back to that. Okay. So I think this may not have been included in my... Um, so if you're submitting from the standard um, practice, um, you would submit two practice samples based on two different areas. So. Uh, that could be assessment, intervention, consultation, or management, administration, kind of like program development or evaluation. Um, if you're submitting under the primary care um, area, then you would submit, you, you'd have the option of submitting five brief cases and in intervention. Four of those must be clinically health psychology related. So chronic pain, diabetes, sleep, and then one could be traditional mental health area. So just focusing on depression within primary care. Um, consultation would be six brief cases. Four of those would be in clinical health psychology area. And then program development or management within primary care. So this could be classes, clinical pathways, practice guidelines that you had, uh, had developed, maybe disease management strategies or other programs that maybe you have developed along with the team. Um, so if you're, if you're submitting solely an integrated primary care, you would select two of the three categories. So intervention, consultation, program development, they have to be two. Um, you could also do one, one, um, uh, one PC focus and one standard practice sample. So you, you could submit from one area of like intervention, um, PC focus where you would submit five brief cases and then one standard uh, element where maybe you would submit just one assessment. Um, remember when you're submitting these samples, especially if you're using the standard candidate, you really wanna, you, you have to submit from two different clinical categories or areas. So sometimes people will submit an assessment that was focused on uh, maybe say pain management, and then they also submit an intervention uh, that was focused on pain management. You would want, you'd want those to be from two different areas. So uh, maybe one pain assessment and then one sleep intervention. So you don't wanna send uh, just from the same same focus area of treatment. Um, I would highly, highly recommend that 
um, you know, that you get a mentor. Um, I think a mentor uh, can help you navigate the process. It can help you coordinate, review your, your samples, uh, your practice samples, giving, give you some guidance on whether or not you're on the right track. Um, you know, and, and by having a mentor, I think it can really save you a lot of time. Um, you know, this is kind of a big area where people don't always know uh, the information and kind of what's expected. And so really kind of getting ahead of the, the game can help you a lot in this process. <coughs> I know we only have a couple more minutes, so I'm gonna... Um, so you can have three possible outcomes of your practice samples, uh, revise uh, and resubmit. You could be asked to provide new samples and hopefully you, you just got proceed to the oral exam. So there were no submission or resubmissions that needed to be completed. You, you submitted them on the first try and you got the good, you got the go and you get to proceed to the oral examination. Okay. This is my part and I, I apologize here for I'm trying to answer questions in the chat as well. So there was one question related to, and I'll, I'll kind of address some of these um, now, related to how would I find out more about whether or not my, my experience would meet those um, those qualifications. There are, and we'll talk about more resources on the website, and that, that is further defined in the applicant or the candidate materials listed on the ABIP website under the clinical health um, psychology certification. But I would read those. If that does not clarify it, then I would reach out to the staff to talk about specifics related to that. I hesitate to, you know, give a yes or a no answer related to someone's specific qualifications, but that's how I would approach that. The, the other question was related to the endorsements and do they have to come from board certified psychologists? They do not, but you know they need to be someone who can speak to, um, you know, your training and, and character, et cetera. Um, and you can look at those endorsement forms um, that are provided. There was another question related to so if you don't have an APA accredited postdoc, um, is it impossible then to to get an ABIP in clinical psychology? That is not the case. Um, so. When, if we were to go back to some of those slides and, and you go through that documentation, there are pathways for postdoctoral experiences that were not APA or CPA approved. There are nuances within that. So you need to just go back and, and look at those particular nuances and, and determine there, um, again, from some of the information that we'll post here at the end, whether or not those experiences seem as though they will meet that. And again, if you have further questions, you can reach out um, uh, individually. So in terms of the oral examination, um, I, I have the pleasure of coordinating these oral exams, which has been particularly fun during COVID times, but we have moved to more of a, a virtual environment for our oral examinations for the time being. They, these are typically scheduled three times a year. Um, however, we have had more since um, we are doing them virtually. I think that at some point in time, we will discuss whether or not we will continue that moving forward and if we'll offer those in-person and virtual exams, um, you know, and we'll talk about how we'll, how we'll do that and how that will be decided in future meetings. But there is a $450 fee for an oral examination and it follows an assessment center module. And really what that means is, is, is that you will meet with an, a different examiner for each module. And the four modules are ethics and legal issues, professional issues, your practice sample, and a standardized 
uh, clinical case and integration. So those are the four different modules and you will have, um, you know, an hour within each of those modules. I say an hour, it's, uh, it's about 55 minutes. And then you will be, um, that oral examination will be assessed for the eight foundational competencies, which include individual and cultural diversity, ethics and legal standards and policy, evidence-based practice, interdisciplinary systems, professional, professionalism, ref reflective practice, and self-awareness and self-care, relationships, and scientific knowledge and methods. It's important for me, again, coordinating the exams to, to let you know that this is collegial in nature. This, once you reach this portion, you have put a lot of time, heart and soul into getting to that point. And so this is an opportunity for you to talk through your practice and what you do to explain your practice samples in greater detail. And so, you know, this is really your opportunity to display your expertise. Um, and again, very collegial in nature in terms of how those questions um, in terms of back and forth are asked. So after the oral examination, uh, the chair of the exam committee sends the results to um, central office. And you usually receive those notifications within one month. Um, you know, typically we strive to get those out. I will say I do strive as the exam coordinator to get those out within two weeks, um, but sometimes it does take a little bit longer. Um, but we give ourselves that cushion there related to a month. Um, you will be able to use uh, the title of board certified in clinical health psychology as a result of uh, passing the oral exam. Division 38 members receive a $125 application refund and um, you are immediately conferred into the membership at fellow status in the American Academy of Clinical Health Psychology. You also received 10 hours of clinical education credits um, because ABIP is an APA approved, uh, approved provider. And you get recognition at the ABIP convention, um, convocation at ABIP, uh, sorry, I butchered that, recognition at, uh, at ABIP convocation at APA's national convention. So you, you are recognized for achieving the status. Um, there is a maintenance of board certification. So this is an annual attestation statement that you make an annual $185 renewal fee is um, due at the time of that attestation. And every 10 years, there is a maintenance of certification review. So reviewing your practice and so a statement related to, to that, that you are maintaining the standards of practice within clinical health psychology. So in terms of any, we'll, we'll take questions, but I also want to highlight the additional resources that we have here. And again, what I was referencing earlier is this link to the American Academy of Clinical Health Psychology, the, the web page where you're able to find all of the documents related to the application. There are also um, video tutorials on YouTube. So there is a YouTube channel for um, the um, clinical health psychology ABIP. And please feel free to reach out. Um, you can reach out to Dr. Shook um, or uh, Dr. Furdom here um, and we'll answer any questions to here that I see in the chat. Um, repeat the categories for the standard application. I, I don't know. So I don't know if that was for the oral exam or if I, I guess for the standard application, repeat the categories. I may need further clarification related to that. 
Oh, for the standard application, the categories? Right. So assessment, intervention, consultation, and then uh, program management? I don't know. I don't know if that was the 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 nature of the question or not so but but if so there are so there's the standard just to make sure okay so yes that did get at the that did answer the question there what would cause samples not to be accepted the first round there are within again on that website there is a list of sort of how the the practice samples are reviewed and what they are looking for in terms of the rubric um, related to how those are read and re and reviewed and so you can see it's 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 more about, um, you know, kind of looking through that and making sure you've addressed different components and, and related to that rubric. So if your clinical samples fail to, you know, uh, again, if you fail to provide an ethical, you know, fully explain an ethical situation or something along those lines, that might be a reason. Or if you did not provide a Let's say you provided four samples instead of six, and in terms of the 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 practice sample section, if you will, that you're supposed to submit, there there may be some questions related to that, or maybe you didn't fully explain your your thought process related to either diagnosis or the treatment plan, et cetera. So it, there are many different things that go into the grading of the practice sample. Um, and so you can look at that rubric and how that is, is reviewed. Um, how do you request, so there was a question related to, do you have to pay for a mentor? And the answer to that is no, um, you do not have to pay for a mentor. Those are assigned um, to you. Is there a, de a deadline for applications? No, um, there is. so. Once you submit your application, your, your generic application form, and you, you are approved, there are deadlines related to how long you have to submit all of your materials. So, so again, all of that is listed on the American Academy of Clinical Health Psychology uh, website materials. So the link for mentorship can you post the link to, men to mentorship? Michael, I don't know if you want to speak to that. I think that they are just assigned. They are. Um, so uh, Chris, so you point. can, I, I believe you can email Christina and she, she's in, I believe she's in charge of assigning mentors now. So she's, she's the program kind of manager of the mentorship program for clinical health psych. So Dr. Shook. So you would coordinate with her and she would, um, she would uh, help you with the mentorship process. And I will throw this out there too, because those mentorship, I mean, that mentorship assignment is really a volunteer sort of group of people who volunteer for that. If for some reason you find that you're not getting what you want from that mentor, or you feel like you need something a little bit different, um, you can also ask for a different mentor and again, reach out uh, to Dr. Shook related to that. There's another question related to, have there been any moves within the VA to help offset the cost of board certification? Um, I don't know the answer to that particular question, but I will say that there are particular scholarships that you can apply for. And I looked at our website for um, clinical health a bit today, and I don't know that that's been updated, but uh, there were some scholarships that we were uh, intending to offer to help offset um, some of that cost. Yeah, I'm not aware of any, and it probably would depend VA by VA, but typically not that I'm aware of. Uh, the one thing is, is that some VAs, uh, and I think most VAs, you would get a step increase. So there can be a potential pay increase by becoming board certified. I know that I, you know, I did get a step increase when 
when I went through the process. So um, I think that's one way it generally can be financially positive. Yes. Yes, and, and then too, the, the other benefits that we went through, and I, and I know that continuing education, there's a lot to be said that you are able to get within the VA already, but you do receive 10 hours of continuing education credit as well. Um, and also if you are a member of Division 38, so there, there are some other resources and benefits that sort of pay off there related to board certification. Um, there are, um, there was a question related to, again, sort of specifics related to, you know, sort of training and then, you know, how that training may manifest itself into, am I um, able to, to do this? And again, generally there are different pathways if you did not complete um, an APA or CPA approved postdoctoral uh, training. So those are, there, there are other pathways. So I will say yes, but I will not um, sort of comment related to whether that particular experience or whatnot would meet that. I just, I hesitate to give you a yes um, on that without seeing all of the detail. There was, to answer, there was an option for people who had been practicing for greater than 20 years in terms of a senior psychologist for those um, now who are applying under the 2018 manual. If you applied and are still in that process, there was one, but since it's been updated, that is not the case. There are those two particular pathways where you can do, um, forget how to how to how it was worded in terms of the specialties, uh, the standard candidate, or you have the standard candidate in primary care. So those are the two options. Let's see. How would you do it? So again, in terms of postdoctoral experience, there are three different, three distinct pathways um, related to that and, and how you can move through that. How would you differentiate health psychology boarding from rehab site boarding? So clinical health, I mean, for me, uh, again, I'm board certified in clinical health psychology. For me, clinical health, we are looking at the biopsychosocial model and how we are engaging in preventative disease, how we, how are we engaging to prevent disease, how we are treating, um, you know, that disease from a particular biopsychosocial standpoint, and also looking at how we're engaging to improve healthcare system delivery or the healthcare system. And so for me, that is a little bit different. I can't speak to rehab psychology boarding because I'm, I, I'm not boarded in that. But to me, that definition of clinical health psychology really separates us apart from others. And, you know, there's a tip in the, in the chat related to anyone looking for approved USBs for ABIT work samples. There is a, a, a SharePoint site that was posted. Any other questions or? I'm not sure if you addressed the question regarding requiring a postdoc. Maybe you have. So what I was saying related to the postdoc is, is that there are three separate pathways. Maybe it would be helpful to kind of go back to that particular slide related to, to the postdoctoral requirements. I think that's slide number eight. Mm 
went forward. Nope. Right. Do one more. So if you look at this, there are different pathways, and I apologize for not explaining this well. So there are different pathways. If you had a postdoctoral year that was a, an APA or CPA accredited clinical health psychology fellowship, then that's one pathway. You could have completed two postdoctoral years at, and those postdoctoral years could have been at an APA or CPA accredited fellowship in an area that was not related to clinical health psychology, but it included greater than or equal to 50% of clinical health psych training plus a year of experience. Or, or you could have had a non-accredited APIC listed clinical health psychology fellowship and a year of clinical health psychology experience. Or you could have after three years postdoc including you could have had a year of supervised training in clinical health psychology or two and plus two years of clinical health psychology experience. I think what the, the goal of this is, is, is that this is this, this sort of requirement is making sure that you have a level of expertise beyond your doctoral training. And so it's making sure that you have had education and experience in clinical health psychology. I'm having a hard time. I'm reading, I'm sorry, I'm reading the comments because I don't understand what it would look like not to practice clinical health psychology at a VA. Not to practice? Well, so like I think PTSD, general mental health. I think, you, you know, I, having, having worked in a VA setting for a period of time, I, I think, again, what this is getting at is, is do you have that level of education and um, experience that designates you as a clinical health psychologist? It's not that you know you just happen to, to work in primary care, that there was some education and training and supervision in this specialty area. Yeah, so I don't know if it'll, this adds to, any, to clarifying, but so I worked in the VA for many years. I got board certified in clinical psychology while I was at the VA, and I did not consider myself and do not consider myself a clinical health psychologist. So I work primarily with serious mental illness. So um, I often looked at, you know, people that worked in general mental health or PCMHI or home-based primary care that had specialty practice in clinical health areas as clinical health psychologists. So setting definitely has an influence, but I do think it's the specialty practice above all else. And I think what, what I, you know, and I understand um, participants, you know, wanting to know hey, I, I've had this particular experience and when would that qualify? I think what is gonna be important is, is to really communicate that in the application materials and discussing that with um, ABIP clinical health psychology staff, um, you know, to kind of help you navigate that. Uh, again, I'm hesitant to provide a concrete yes or no. Um, and to add to what you just said, I, I did not have um, an APA approved uh, clinical health psychology fellowship. My clinical health psychology fellowship was, uh, it was a two year clinical health psychology fellowship, um, but it was non accredited. And I did have greater than one year experience in clinical health psychology. So I, I was the third pathway here for me. Um, but, you know, I, I do think that that, that, is, that is sort of, you know, important to put that into an application or to put that into some form, reading those materials and seeing if that would 
um, meet that criteria. So maybe people are getting confused the term postdoctoral they're, they're thinking of it the same thing as like a fellowship maybe so so, so, the, so the third so the, the the last one here is is after you've graduated do you have one year of supervised experience in clinical health psychology and two years of clinical health psychology experience so again, and I appreciate Josh in the, in the chat, thank you for, for that clarification. I think it, it is really designated that you have had that education beyond your doctoral level training in the area of clinical health psychology. All right. Are there any other questions, uh, comments? Please feel free to email me if you have any. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll probably have to direct you um, because I can't answer questions on clinical health psychology. Uh, but I definitely have a copy of the slides, so I'm happy to disseminate those. Feel free to email me. Um, if there's no other questions, sure. I really want to thank our presenters today. Um, it was a fantastic presentation. Thank you for answering. Uh, all the questions. I think the ability to ask these questions is one of the most important parts of the webinar. Yeah. Uh, we can disseminate exam manuals and slides, but uh, getting more specific information about uh, candidates or prospective uh, candidates uh, 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 practice and their concerns is probably the best part of this uh, presentation series. So thank you again. Um, uh, I'll be uploading this presentation to uh, the ABAP YouTube channel in probably a few weeks. So it won't go up immediately. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. And I've posted in the chat, uh, there was a question related to a website link for the clinical health psychology and I posted that link in the chat. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Take care.